Tonight, uh, tonight I'm going off the grid. Tonight we're not using PowerPoint. So, um, uh, I generally uh, am accustomed to not using PowerPoint when I preach on the parables of Jesus. And uh, that's just, uh, for some reason, I just, I just don't like using PowerPoint. Uh, I don't feel it, told, it really aged all that much when, uh, when I do talk about the, the parables of Christ. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 15 tonight. If you turn with me over there, Luke chapter 15. We'll remain in this chapter for the duration of the lesson. This is a wonderful chapter. Luke chapter 15. Within the chapter we have three illustrations of Jesus, three parables of sorts, uh, one after the other, and they all have to do with the same uh, subject. So it is, it is fitting for us to give consideration to these uh, three illustrations that he draws uh, here in the 15th chapter of Luke. And so that's what we'll be doing here tonight. And all of this started, as you see in verse 1, all of this started because we see all of the tax collectors and sinners drawing near to Christ to hear Him. They've come to hear. They've come to hear the words of Jesus. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's a situation where, you know, he, you think you'd have a, a smile on your face. As you see these individuals, they, they're all coming. It, it, uh, it seems like it, it's, a, a, it's a pretty large group here that have come. And there are certainly individuals that, that need to hear. They need to hear the truth. They need salvation. Uh, and so you have this large group. They're, they're coming. And, and they've come to hear Jesus. And uh, certainly this is... This is perfect. I mean, this is exactly uh, what Jesus would want, and certainly he's going to be talking to these individuals and teaching these individuals. But if you'll notice there in verse 2, it says, And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so verse 1 starts out with this wonderful picture. That, uh, verse 1 is, is really kind of a... a statement here. This is, is such an a, a important statement of the gospel and what the gospel is. Sinners coming to hear Jesus. And, and then verse 2 it says that the Pharisees complained. They complained about it. They weren't happy about it. They weren't happy. They said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And you know, certainly their main complaint is with Christ. And the uh, you know, there's a lot of background here between the Pharisees and, and Christ that, you know, that comes with uh, this particular complaint is that, uh, uh, that uh, the Pharisees did not like Jesus. Uh, people wanted to come and hear Jesus and, and uh, the Pharisees wanted the crowds to, to come and, and, uh, and, and surround them, uh, but they were surrounding Christ instead. And uh, so this is uh, kind of a, a rivalry of sorts, you know, in the minds of the Pharisees. Uh, and, and so any time we have such a great multitude coming around Jesus, you know, the Pharisees don't like it. And so here they're complaining. <clears throat> they're saying, they're, they're uh, claiming that Jesus uh, receives sinners and, and eats with them. Well, you know, he was, he was eating with them. We see him many other times in the scriptures uh, eating, you know, with individuals who who have uh, been very worldly, individuals who have no relationship with God. Uh, sure, he eats with them. Sure, he builds a rapport with them. He doesn't accept their sin, but he teaches them about salvation. In his building of rapport, in his sitting down with them, in in in, in that action of this man cares. This man is concerned. You know, they're certainly not going to get that from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were, you know, of that uh, religious uh, idea of holier than thou. You know, and, you know, don't, don't come.
come near us, you sinners. You know, uh, you know, religion's not for sinners. You know, that, this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have the Pharisees taking a completely different stand here on what's going on here in the text. And this is when Jesus uh, uh, spews out here three, one after the other, uh, illustrations, parables, if you will, uh, uh, about this particular situation. In verse 4 he said, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who, who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And so this is his first uh, you know, dialogue here uh, with them. Uh, as, as he says, what man of you? You know, he, he is calling the, the, the Pharisees, you know, here into question as he says, what man of you, having 100 sheep, and he loses one sheep, does he not leave the 99 in the wilderness, he says, and go to, and to you know, and search for the one that, that is lost? And, uh, and, and by the way, when, when he says uh, that, that he would leave the 99 in the wilderness, he's referring to their, their usual abode, their, their usual location of flock. It's not that, it's not that they're, you know, he, he's walking away from 99 as they're surrounded by wolves as he's saying, I need to go find this other one. You know, it, it's, you know this, this is a shepherd, you know, and, and he, he understands the situation and he's very wise and, and he knows of the, the safety of his sheep very well. Uh, it's, it's ludicrous to think that he's just, uh, you know, just tossing away the 99 to look for one. That's not even close to the point that Jesus is making here. But uh, the point is that he does leave the 99. <clears throat> he leaves the flock to go and, and find the one. And Jesus says that when he does find the one, he puts it on his shoulders and he rejoices. He gets home. He calls his friends and neighbors. He tells them what he's found. You know, this tells me that he's already told his friends and neighbors that he has lost one. Okay? So he's already explained. He's called around. He's concerned. Uh, he, he is worried uh, about, uh, about uh, this, uh, this sheep. And uh, so he has told his friends, he's told his neighbors, but now that he has gone and he has found the sheep, he's bringing it back, he's, he's rejoicing. He is absolutely rejoicing. He's very happy and he tells his friends, he tells his neighbors, rejoice with me. Rejoice with me because I found the, the, the one that, 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 I had, that I had lost. And Jesus uh, 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 takes a glance into heaven here in verse 7 when he says, and I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner, sinner who re repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Those who are already in the proper care. Those who are already, you know, resting. You know, they're at peace and, and, and they're... They're, they're, they're safe safe in the arms of God. You know, they're, they're doing what they need to be doing day in and day out. Uh, you know, they, certainly God takes great pleasure in them. God takes great pleasure in them. But the point that Jesus is making here is for the one that got away. You know, for the one that, that, uh, that, that has been lost. Maybe, you know, maybe since just, just after their upbringing in childhood or, or something like that. You know, the time in which they first kind of enter out there into the world. Um, because as a child, they were in the hands of God. You know, as a child, they, 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 you know, they were in His arms. But, uh, um, but now they, they've learned of the world. They go off. And when, when God finds one, you know, when, when one is brought back to a relationship with God, one is brought back to a point in which their sins are washed away, and it was, it's just like as they were when they were a child, you know, sinless. The joy, the text says, the joy in heaven. There will be more joy in heaven over this sinner than, than
the 99 who God already has on, on his side. Um, and so, you know, we, we can, it's very clear to see how this relates to the issue here with the Pharisees as they're saying it's, he's eating with sinners. He's eating with sinners. He receives sinners. These are the folks that, that God is seeking. You know, these are the lost ones that God desires that they be found, that they come to salvation. God is waiting to rejoice in their salvation. <coughs> now he, he keeps on going. And in verse 8 he says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so it's uh, clear from his uh, conclusion that he draws from this short parable that he's speaking real of, the, of the exact same situation in this text, but it's just a different illustration. Here we have a woman. And she has ten silver coins. She doesn't have more than ten silver coins. She has ten silver coins, and that's it. That's all that she has. Uh, now, you know, uh, specifically, technically, she has uh, ten drachmas, okay? Um, uh, of an equivalency of a dollar fifty-two dollars or something like that as far as U.S. currency is concerned. So, um, uh, here you have this woman. She has two dollars. She doesn't have more in the bank. She doesn't have more anywhere. She has two dollars. She loses part. Notice what she does. She does exactly what any of us in this situation would do. She lights a lamp. She sweeps the house. She searches carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends, she calls her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found the peace which I lost. And this tells us, you know, how, how in, in dire need she was. How in absolute dire need she was uh, for her to be calling her friends and her neighbors, saying, I found the coin. I found the coin. Oh, she needed that coin. She absolutely needed it. God needs the world. God needs the world. He created each and every man and woman on this planet. He loves them. He loves them so much so that He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for their sins. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. For God so loved the world. For God so loved sinners. Like you and like me. For God so loved the sinners of this world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. God is desiring and searching for one who would have a change of heart to come to Him. To Him, it's like this woman. Ten coins. She loses one. She needs that. She needs that to live. She needs that to survive. Um, and, and so when she finds it, when, when it's back safe in her arms again, she calls her friend. She calls her neighbor. She says, rejoice with me. I found it. Rejoice, I found it. Notice what he says, the conclusion in verse 10. He says, likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, so what, what these parables are, are doing is, is they are addressing the heart of God. Okay? The, the first two have... And, and the third is not going to be any different. They are all addressing the heart of God. And Jesus is painting a picture here in very simple terms. 
of the heart of God, and, and it is certainly showing a very strong contrast between the heart of the Pharisees. Okay, and they're showing that, that what is in the heart of the Pharisees is greatly, greatly lacking here. That they are not in alignment by any stretch of the imagination with God's heart. Uh, this, these parables are, are addressing how God feels, you know, and His heart towards uh, someone who is lost. And He wants them to be found. He wants them to come to salvation. And this is exactly why Jesus, who has the heart of God, is sitting with the tax collectors and the sinners. He's sitting with them. He's eating with them. It's very clear from what Jesus is talking about here that he's not sitting with them and eating with them because he, in, he intends to, to, uh, uh, to have them led to believe that they're all okay. Everyone's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Everything's fine. No, no, nothing is fine. Nothing is fine at that table when we have a score of individuals who are lost and God wants them to be found. Jesus is sitting at the table because He wants them to be found. Jesus is sitting at the table because God is in dire need of that they be saved. That is the love that He has for them. Just as the shepherd has that love for that sheep. Just as uh, many of us have, uh, as parents have that love for our children. It's a, a terrifying thought. I, I think about it all too often. To, to lose, you know, a child. Maybe out and about. J.C. Penney's something, you know, to not know where they're at. I just, I can't, I, I haven't gone through it, and I don't want to go through it, because that is my all-time greatest fear uh, in the world. All-time greatest fear. I would take anything else uh, on this planet. <clears throat> in verse 11, it says, Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. <clears throat> and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, uh, journeyed uh, to a far country, and there washed, his, uh, or excuse me, wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Okay, wasteful living. When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into, the, into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. All right, so let's stop here for a moment because this one is uh, certainly uh, particularly uh, long uh, in the parable and there's a lot of detail, uh, a lot more detail than the lost sheep or the lost coin. Um, Jesus goes in deep here with, uh, with a lot of these ideas. And he addresses this, this subject of, of, a, of a father who has considerable amount of wealth. And in, in the text, he has at least two sons. And you have the young son, okay? He's young, he's certainly unwise and inexperienced. But he says to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that fall to me. And uh, his, his father allows that to happen. His father uh, basically, you know, gives him his inheritance is the idea. Gives him his inher inheritance ahead of time. And uh, it seems to be uh, quite a bit. Seems to be a, a great deal of, of possessions. And uh, 
and then verse 13, notice it says that not many days after, the young son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions on prodigal living. And so you have this individual, and what two things does he want in verse 12 and 13? He wants possessions, okay? He wants money, he wants his inheritance. And verse 13 is very clear that he also wants to get away. He, he wants to get out from, from under his, his father's house. He wants to uh, not just get out of his father's house, but he wants to go far away. He goes here to a far country. So he wants to be completely uh, off the radar here. Um, completely away from, from, uh, from anyone who even knows him or anything like that. Uh, getting away from all accountability, all responsibility, all chores on, in his father's house and all these kinds of things. Um, but it's interesting because... He still wants his father's stuff, okay? He still wants his father's good stuff, all right? And so this is his scheme here, essentially, is, is Father, give me your stuff, but, you know, I don't want to work for you. You know, I don't want to, to live under your house or anything like that. I want to get as far away from you as possible, and, you know, this is such an interesting uh, illustration, interesting parallel to what we see uh, in the world. You know, it, it, with, it really, if anyone in the world is that uh, everyone in the world is after God's stuff, but they don't want anything at all to do with God. They could care less about God they could care less about serving him in his house, okay, in his church. They want to be as far away from that as possible, but they still have come, have come to him, you know, in a manner of speaking, and have said, give me your stuff. Give me your rain. Give me your sunshine. Give me air that I can breathe. You know, give me this, give me that. Uh, you know, all this kinds of stuff. You know, the, the world is constantly taking and, and using God's stuff, and yet they have no intention on serving Him. They want to be far away from Him as possible. And uh, so it, it's an interesting, I think it's kind of a, a phenomenon, really. You know, this, this uh, you know, the, the ways of the world is, is that... You know, without God, they, you know, they have nothing. They don't have air to breathe. They don't have a heart that can pump. They have nothing. So, they make provisions. I'll enjoy your stuff. I'll enjoy your possessions. I'll enjoy what you have, God. But I want to be as far away from you as possible. I want to go to a far country. Well... This is what we see in the text. This man here in the text, this young man, is, is, you know, nearly everybody on the earth. The parable that he's drawing is nearly everybody on the earth at one point and time in their life. Living off of God's stuff, but not being anywhere near God. Now, you notice how he abuses the situation he, uh, he wastes himself on, uh, on prodigal living, which we find out at the very end of the parable. Um, he had wasted that money on, uh, on prostitutes, on harlots. Now, a severe famine broke out. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he's already spent all the money, spent all the inheritance, and he's now in want. And so he finds a citizen of this foreign country, and the citizen allows him into the fields to, to feed the swine. 
So he's, he's had a, 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 certainly a very low point in his life, a very, a very low point. Uh, it's interesting that, that Jesus is talking here to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now remember, Jesus is a Jew. He's talking to a, a group of very strong, strong Jews. And the parable is this. This man has wasted everything in his life. And the situation that he is now placed in is the lowest of the low for a Jew to be feeding swine. Get those pigs away from me. You know, if you're a Jew, get those unclean animals, get those hooven animals out of my sight. Oh no, this man's down there, down there on his knees, you know, feeding the hooven animal, the unclean animal of the old law. Look. Absolutely disgusting for a Jew. That's why Jesus used the analogy. You know, he could have used any kind of analogy to, to explain how low this man has gotten, but he used the hooven animal because of who he's talking to in the audience. But uh, now he says, uh, it says in verse uh, 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? You know what we're looking for? You know what Jesus was looking for? Today we're looking for the one person in Rapid City today who've come to themselves. A series of events, most likely, have presented that interesting opportunity in their life by which they come to themselves. And uh, that's, that's whom we are, are seeking. That's whom we want to find. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this individual, he came to himself. But notice, notice what happened. Notice what it took. Okay? He was with the Father. He was with God. Each and every day, you know, he sat at the table. Each and every day, you know, did he have responsibility? Did he have accountability there by his father? Sure he did. You know, but, but he had a very good life. He hadn't come to himself. He was out there. He had change and despair. He hadn't come to himself. He was out there spending all of his dimes on, on prostitution. He still hadn't come to himself. He loses all of his money. He still hadn't come to himself. He gets his nose in with the other snouts of the swine. Finally, he comes to himself. He had to lose everything and then some to come to himself. And when he did, he realizes how good his father is and how good his father's house is. And he says, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. This is a man who's speaking logically. Now this is a man who's also speaking humbly. I mean, that's a long walk back home. And that is a long walk. You know, the second he sees his father, that is a hard, hard journey. Uh, and, uh, and so there's also uh, uh, a lot to be learned here as far as the humility that this man has gained here along the way. And uh, in verse uh, 20, it says that he arose and came to his father, and when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring in his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat. And be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. Now stop here for one moment once again. One thing that 
you know, I love about this man in, in this story that Jesus is telling here is that he told us what his plan was, didn't he? He was there with the swine and he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to tell him I have sinned. I have sinned against him. I've sinned against heaven. And then in verse 20, when he actually goes to his father, notice he's a long way off. His father spots him. Okay? Now that could have been just sheer luck, or that could have been a father looking every day for that son. I don't know. But he sees him from a long way off, and he runs to him. The father is running to him, grabs a hold of him, kisses his neck. He is absolutely ecstatic to see his son. He's overjoyed over his son. What you wonder? <laughs> what do you think? Possibly, as the son is sitting here, his father, just overjoyed, kissing his neck, hugging him, that the son was scratching his head thinking, I don't actually have to say those, you know, terribly difficult words to say. I, you know, this is actually working out pretty good. He's hugging on me, kissing on me. This is nice. But then, in verse 21, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's what he had planned to say, and that's exactly what he said. And, you know, he took it all the way. He understood that's what he needed to say. That's what needed to happen. And while his, his walking back to his father, his father understood that that was repentance enough, you know, we, we still have the son, you know, I, you know it doesn't look like he, you know, he had to. It doesn't look like he had to even ever say a thing to his father about this. He says, Father, I have sinned against you. Well, we see what the father did. Brings out the best robe. You know, he's, he's overjoyed. They're, they're, he's going to have a celebration. He's going to have a feast. Because he said, my son was dead. And is alive again. In verse 25, it says, now, that, now his older son was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called to the servants and asked uh, what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. So, this is the uh, third, you know, and last parable that Jesus gives here in this particular situation of the Pharisees complaining. Jesus is sitting over there with sinners. You know, it's very clear, each and every one of these demonstrated what the heart of the father was in this case. And, and, and this, this parable of, of the prodigal son, you know, it, it goes into great detail here as far as the father's heart. And, and this, this last point that he makes 
with his dialogue, the father's dialogue between the elder son, here really wraps it all up and, uh, and, and, and displays quite a bit, not only more of what the father's heart is, but also who is the elder son in the text? Who do you think it is? You know, it could be anybody today. I mean, it can apply to a lot of different people, but when Jesus spoke, it was the Pharisees. You know, that was the individual. Jesus was sitting at the table with the sinners, right? There, that's the prodigal son. That's the wasteful son. Okay, that's the individual wasting their life away. And, and he is sitting there to win them over. He's sitting, sitting there to bring them back to the Father. And you have these individuals, these, these Pharisees, you know. And I don't think Jesus is, is uh, speaking in this way to make the point that the Pharisees were A-OK -okay and all right with God. Because it's very clear from many other scriptures that, that, that Jesus does not believe they were A-OK. -okay. Uh, but uh, that's, that's not the point uh, that he's, that he's uh, bringing up here. Um, I think, I think this, his idea is in talking about the elder son and what the elder son says, saying, I've been with you these many years. I've never transgressed a single commandment. Is Jesus looking at this from his perspective or from the perspective of the Pharisees? You see, this is the elder son talking. This isn't Jesus' interpretation of the elder son's heart, is it? No, it's not. Jesus is simply kind of repeating here in the parable what the elder son's disposition is. This is the disposition of the Pharisees. We've been here all this time. We've, uh, we've never transgressed a single thing. <laughs> We're the best. Best that's ever been. We're the Pharisees. Well, they're upset. He's upset. The eldest son is upset. Just the Pharisees. Now, uh, the point of the father in the text is, is very simple. He said in verse 31, Son, you, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. And it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. You see, the heart of the father in the text is in great contrast to the heart of the eldest son, um, who did not share in the likeness here of, of his father's heart in the situation. Um, and... Uh, um, you know, dare, dare we not ever be in the situation of the elder son? Dare we not have that kind of heart? We are to have the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ, okay? That's the, the same, same heart that the Father had, the day, same, same disposition, okay? And so... You know, it's always going to be a, a fear of mine that, that I or you or anyone, anyone in the church, anyone long in the church, would be misplaced and have the heart of the elder son, which is actually a Pharisaic heart, a Pharisaic way of, of thinking. Jesus makes it very clear what is in God's heart in this text. He made it clear in his action, not just in the three parables, but in his very action of sitting down and building the rapport with the sinners and tax collectors at the table. Building that rapport, talking to them, eating with them. Hopefully to bring them back. Hopefully that they come to their senses. Just like the prodigal son. Oh, he was wasteful. Oh, he did terrible things. Sure. Sure he did. He wasted a lot of God's goods. He wasted a lot of God's time that God allotted him on this earth. Time in which that prodigal son could have been using serving God. Time in which that prodigal son could be using, uh, you know, teaching others salvation. 
whatever it may be. But the heart of the Father looks at this man who has wasted his goods and wasted his time. And the heart of the Father sees him as lost. And he needs to be found. The heart of the Father sees him as dead. And needs to be made alive. This is to be our disposition on this earth. Appreciate your time and attention this evening. If there's anyone who uh, desires to come unto God's salvation tonight, then won't you let it be known? Or if anyone in the audience here needs the help, the prayers of the congregation in whatever way, uh, won't you please also come forward and let your desires be made known. All together, we stand and sing.